Good afternoon and good evening, wherever you are. It's my pleasure to introduce today's presenters, Sydney Snyder and Diane Stair Fenner. I'll start with Diane only because I've known her the longest. Sometimes you meet somebody fortuitously, and that chance encounter can change your life. About 10 years ago, Diane peer reviewed a manuscript for Corwin, and it came to my attention that she was also interested in writing a book. That idea became advocating for English learners, an important contribution to the field that I'm immensely proud of. It was also the beginning of a long and enduring partnership that covered the course of four more book projects. Diane brought Sidney Snyder into the fold as co-author of Unlock Unlocking English Learners Potential, a very popular resource that has been acclaimed by teachers ac across the country. Sydney took the lead on their latest book, Culturally Responsive Teaching for Multilingual Learners, which is also the focus of today's session. I urged them to write on the importance of cultural and linguistic sustainability, and they did not disappoint. It's a brilliant book that manages to be both visionary and practical. Both Sydney and Diane began their careers as ELD teachers and their love for multilingual learners shines through in each of their books. Both have taught internationally, as far and wide as West Africa, Indonesia, Germany, and Mexico. Diane formed her own consulting group, Support Ed, in Washington, DC, that is dedicated to empowering multilingual learners and their educators. Sydney also works for Support Ed as a principal associate. They are both exceptionally talented professional developers, educators, and writers, and it's an honor to count them as my authors and dear friends. Thank you so much, Dan. Um, thank you so much for that warm and beautiful introduction, and I can't believe it's been 10 years already, and I look forward to the next 10. Yeah, it was a fortuitous meeting for sure and I remember the first time meeting you in person and how much you've supported our work ever since so we're eternally grateful um, for your support so looking at oops I hit the wrong button looking at what we're going to be focusing on today um, our objectives are we're going to together explore the definition of culture and its characteristics You'll learn about the role of culture in teaching and learning for multilingual learners. We'll discuss five guiding principles for developing a culturally responsive school climate for multilingual learners. And then you'll apply some tools framed around these five principles to your context. We also wanna share that, as Dan mentioned, we're very practical, we're all framed in research, but our aim is to provide practical research-based resources for teachers, and um, all educators who support, who support multilingual learners. And to that end, we have a padlet of tools that goes along and with this presentation. And you can access our, um, our PowerPoints here, and you can also access all of the resources that we'll be referring to. And whenever you see this little crane, origami crane, in the lower right-hand corner of your screen, it means that a resource we're referring to is linked to on the Padlet as well. And I believe Corwin just um, shared that link in the chat. So you can go ahead and click on that link and this Padlet will remain live after our presentation today. So our uh, time with you today is framed around our new book, Culturally Responsive Teaching for Multilingual Learners. And we're really happy to share that it just recently became a bestseller. So thanks to anyone who has already taken it for a spin. Uh, let us know in the chat if you already have the book. It'd be great to hear who, you know, hear from you who has already taken a look at it. And right now, if you're on Twitter, um, we're taking part in a slow chat on Twitter where you read a chapter a week and answer some questions. And in addition uh, to providing us all of this wonderful support with writing the book, Corwin has also uh, was instrumental in us getting into classrooms 
and filming what culturally responsive teaching might actually look like in some different contexts. So um, if you take a look at this link uh, that we're, that's being shared in the chat right now, you can click on, you can access all of the videos for free that are in the book, as well as download uh, appendices of tools from the book that you can print and you can use. So hopefully you'll take a look at some of these great resources. We want to get started. We've, uh, Dan has given us a lovely introduction, and I'm Diane, by the way, if you don't know me already. Um, please take a minute and in the chat, share how you're feeling about culturally responsive teaching for multilingual learners this year. Is it A, B, or C in the chat? One obstacle after another, B, I got this, or C, I'm still hanging on. So go ahead and share in the chat. Are you an A or a B or a C, all of the above? Does it depend on the day? I'm not seeing anything come through on my chat. Three participants have raised their hands. Hmm. Chat is not available. Uh-oh. So go ahead and use the Q&A. I see people have found a workaround. Chat is disabled. Oh my. <laughs> so we're trusting the Corwin folks are working that out. So you can go ahead and use the Q&A. This will be fun. So I see a lot of you are responding that way. Ah, it looks like we got the chat back again. Okay, chat's working. It's like, boy, they're very quiet. Usually people are more talkative on the chat. Um, yeah, so go ahead and share now in the chat. Are you an A or B or a C? We see all sorts of different responses. So go ahead, please feel free to keep contributing in the chat. We're up to well over 360 participants right now, live. And we're going to think of you know, what you just shared and take a look at what culture means. And we're gonna use the chat again. Oops, sorry about that. So we've provided here four images. So select one of these images or pictures that stands out to you. Which aspects of culture does it highlight? Is it A, B, C, or D? So now share in the chat, but also if you get a chance, what does it highlight about culture to you? What does it mean? Why did you choose A, B, C, or D? Go ahead and take a minute here. Yeah, Charlie said, I can see them all, right? It might depend. It could be A, B, C, and D. Absolutely. Oh, you can't see them all. Yeah, everyday life events, that was for A. Yeah, all of them. You can have many different ways to, to represent culture and to think about them. Yeah, B, they're all interesting, but the vibrancy stands out the most. Great. And we like these types of activities for our students to have them choose the best image or the most appropriate image and then to explain why, why they chose that. So let's look at a common definition of culture. Um, and if you'd like to share your own definition first in the chat, that would be great too. And we know there are many varied definitions of culture for sure, but it's generally understood that culture can be a system of shared beliefs, values, customs, behaviors, and artifacts that the members of society use to interact with their world and with one another. So think about the images we just looked at. How would those depict culture in terms of beliefs, values, customs, behaviors, artifacts? So be, be thinking about that. And if you'd like to share what your definition of culture is in the chat, that would be great too. And in terms of exploring culture a, a little bit more and understanding it, we, you know, it's really important to keep in mind that culture is complex and dynamic, so it's changing all of the time. And for that reason, and many reasons, it can be challenging because it can really manifest itself in different ways. And because a lot of aspects of culture are invisible, which I'll talk about a little bit next. And we know that um, culture is ever evolving because of historical, political, even pop culture shifts. 
and also generational changes and attitudes and values and behaviors, it can be changing. And everyone, even if they might not recognize it, is a member or, of one or more cultural groups. So we'll be keeping this in mind. And then also we want to keep in mind that within cultural groups, there's a lot of variability. I think, for example, in my teaching, when I taught students from El Salvador, there were so many variations in culture, depending on how students had been raised, what kind of experiences they'd had, how long they'd been in the US, for example. So it's definitely not monolithic. So we're going to take a look next at the three different levels of culture you may have seen before or heard about the iceberg analogy. So um, we look first at the surface level culture. So these are elements that are visible, that tend to be visible, like food, clothing, and even language. Um, they're understood. We expect to see these differences and they carry a low emotional load or a low emotional impact. So it means that you expect these differences and they're less likely to cause any kind of misunderstanding or conflict, although I would argue language can cause misunderstandings and conflicts. Um, but looking beneath the surface, we get to the shallow culture. And that can, um, some examples could be your concept of time, nonverbal communication patterns, and rules about eye contact. We see this play out a lot in our classrooms. And these can have more of a higher emotional impact. And then we get to deep culture. Some, some examples are your concepts of self, your beliefs about authority, and your preferences for cooperation or competition. And this deeper level of culture can cause more, a more intense emotional impact. So we'd like you to work on an uh, interactive for you individual activity with a platform called Flippity, which is free, and we're big fans of Flippity. Um, you can go to the link that if you enter bit.ly forward slash culture level, and it's case sensitive, and I'd like you to sort what you see here into surface culture, shallow culture, and deep culture. So you'll put uh, surface culture on the left, you'll drag shallow, sh shallow culture to the middle, and then deep culture to the right and then drag the white in the white boxes, these, um, these uh, beliefs or these concepts under where they would fall. And we give as a scaffold for you, the definitions of each level are in yellow. And Sydney just shared the link that you can actually click on in the chat. I believe that's probably what people are asking about. So go ahead and click on the link that she just shared and I'll share you what it looks like right now. So you just drag it just like this. So just take a minute. Hopefully you get a, a minute to do that. And I'll share the responses. So go ahead and take a look. Did this uh, work well for you? How did your answers compare? How you sorted? So this is a resource, we've linked to it, I believe on the Padlet as well. And if you'd like to do some turnaround training on this topic, please feel free to use this. We've created it for you to use. So now that we've explored what culture is, looked at some definitions, we'll take a look at the role of culture in teaching and learning. And we're gonna start with a scenario. We all love to hear stories. So it's great to um, provide an entry point to this topic by looking at a scenario. So to begin thinking about the role of culture in teaching and learning, let's think about a ninth grader named Leon and her friend Lestari. So they're both taking a biology class, but they submitted, they worked on it together, but, and they submitted the same work. They had to do a model of a cell. And Leanne is a multilingual learner from China who came to the U.S. three years ago with her mom and her younger brother. She's quiet in class, but she's also developed close friendships with other multilingual learners and with a couple of girls on the junior varsity volleyball team where she plays. One of her closest friends is Lestari, and she's an Indonesian student who entered the school last year. So her biology teacher, Miss Morgan, asked them to um, stay after class one day. 
Ms. Morgan explains that despite the fact that Leanne did an excellent job on a model of a cell, she has to give Leanne a zero because Lestari submitted the same work. Ms. Morgan assumed that because Leanne is getting an A in the course, speaks English more fluently, and consistently submits high quality work, she allowed Lestari to copy from her. Leanne explained to Ms. Morgan that they worked on the assignment together and they didn't know that each was going to submit the same work and that that was not allowed. Ms. Morgan is sympathetic, but she still feels that they were cheating. So what, I'm gonna ask you in the chat to share, what role might culture be playing in this scenario? And what can Ms. Morgan and or Leanne do to resolve this situation? Or what would you do? So how is culture playing a role here? That they both received an F and the teacher thought she was cheating. How does culture play a role in this scenario? And go ahead and share that in the chat. And also, what can Ms. Morgan and or Leanne do to resolve the situation? Yeah, Charlie wrote that cooperation is key, but not cheating. The teacher should allow them to do it again. Patricia mentioned collectivism versus individualism. So we're going to be talking about that next. Right, and I see another response about the collectivist culture. Absolutely. And what about the teacher? What could she have done in terms of sharing her expectations up front? What do you think? This seems like a big surprise to the students. Right, the teacher should be clarifying, you know, what the expectations are for the work. Great. Yeah, and giving a clear rubric, absolutely. So along these lines, let's think of how students, teachers, and school cultures converge. And this model comes from our colleague who also wrote the foreword for our book, Dr. Ayana Cooper, who's fabulous. You should check out her work if you're not familiar with it. So um, we'd like you to think about how the beliefs and values that are embedded in school culture, how are they manifested in expectations for students and teachers? So a couple of you commented that this teacher, Ms. Morgan, didn't really clarify her expectations. So what does that tell us about the beliefs and values from her school's culture? What do you think? You don't have to share in, in the chat. If you'd like to, you sure can, but it's something to be reflecting on. And how does that how about the expectations for students and teachers in your school culture? How do they reflect the beliefs and values in your school? Yeah, be thinking about that. So uh, many of you or a few of you mentioned the differences or that Leanne and Lestari probably come from collectivist cultures. So we want to look at this, these two concepts of individualist cultures and collectivist cultures to see what, how they differ. And uh, so in terms of individualist cultures, we look at independence and self-reliance, but in collectivist cultures, interdependence and cooperation are valued. So individualist cultures, we're thinking of personal goals, individual study, individual contributions and status. We focus more on tasks and the purpose of education is learning how to learn. And um, if you're when going against the norms that can lead to guilty feelings. Whereas in collectivist cultures, we look at group goals, group work, group dynamics are really valued and prioritized. Um, the purpose of education is not so much learning how to learn, but learning how to do something. And we can feel, those from collectivist cultures can fee, uh, feel shameful when there are transgression of norms. So um, there are countries that have been shown to be high on individualist cultures. Um, you're probably not surprised that individualist cultures include US, Australia, the Netherlands. Collectivist cultures include um, Indonesia, Pakistan, Guatemala. What about where you teach? Where are your students from? Are they from more collectivist cultures or individualist cultures, or is it a mix? Share in the chat, where are your students? Where do they tend to be from? So some recommendations for what you can do in terms of individualist and collectivist cultures is no matter what, 
we're always seeking to establish relationships with our students. And especially over the past 14 months or so during the pandemic, if you've been teaching in a distance learning or hybrid model, this is even more crucial. And if you're in a face-to-face -face model, it's rebuilding those relationships with students and really um, engaging with them. And fostering a supportive classroom community is so key so that all students can feel comfortable and valued. We also want to look at individual and group accountability if you're doing group projects, giving students choice and really making a big deal out of group successes. So um, I've already asked you where your students' home countries fall on, in terms of individualist and collectivist cultures. You can share that if you haven't yet. But also what resonates with you as you think about individualist and collectivist cultures in your context? What stands out to you? So please go ahead and share in the chat if you would like. If not, you can just reflect. There's a lot of information here. So we also um, want to take a look at what do we know about culturally responsive teaching and the brain by um, a fabulous author, another Corwin book from Zaretta Hammond. Um, let us know in the chat if you're familiar with this book too. And she, she really describes the importance of culturally responsive teaching and the brain, and it's really fascinating. So we know that the brain seeks to minimize social threats. It doesn't want to feel bombarded. It wants to, um, you know, just be maintaining and functioning. Um, and we know that student-teacher and student-student positive relationships help keep this safety threat detection system in check. So you tend to feel less anxiety or less fight or flight response when you do have positive relationships with students and among students. Um, and that our students' culture guides to how we process information. So in cultures with strong oral traditions, we wanna be using stories, art and music and movement because that will help drive learning. It'll help students pay more attention and make connections. Um, especially when we're coupling new information with our students' existing funds of knowledge. So that really speaks to finding out what those funds of knowledge are that our students bring. And finally, one of her many points is that the brain grows through challenge and stretch. So we want to challenge our students and stretch their learning, but also provide that level of support that they need. So Sydney now is going to lead us in the next portion of our time together. Thank you, Diane, and thank you, everyone. It's so nice to be here with you this evening. Um, I'm going to be talking now about um, the five guiding principles of culturally responsive teaching and sharing some tools and resources related to those. Um, so Diane and I, in our review of the research on culturally responsive teaching, um, came up with five guiding principles that we can use to guide our work. And for each of these, we also developed look for so we can think about what does that actually look like in the schools and the districts and the communities um, that we're working with. So I'm going to briefly share these and then um, talk a little bit more about each of them in the remaining time we have. So number one is that culturally responsive teaching is asset based. Number two is that it simultaneously supports and challenges students. Uh, number three, that it places students at the center of the learning. Number four, that it leverages students' linguistic and cultural backgrounds. And number five, that it unites students' schools, families, and communities. And I wanted to share with you on the Padlet, we have a tool, it's called the Guiding Principle Look For Checklist and Goal Setting. And this is a great tool that you can use for collaborating with your colleagues. You can think about each of these guiding principles and the look fors. Um, you can add your own look fors. And then you can think about if you feel like this is being met in your school. No, sometimes, or yes. And this is a way because culturally responsive teaching can can feel overwhelming like there's so many different aspects to it and um, this tool can really help you narrow in on what what your priorities are so how do you where do you want to focus your energies um, and it can again it could be a great discussion with colleagues 
So number one, guiding principle one is assets-based. And this really means that we use a strength-based approach um, for working with multilingual learners and their families. And in doing so, we honor their backgrounds and their home languages, and we use this as, as foundations for learning. Um, it also means that we recognize that family engagement can take a variety of different forms and that it's important to recognize um, these different and maybe unrecognized forms that it might take. For example, it could be families valuing of education or it could be the way that they share knowledge and stories orally. Um, so it might look different than what we traditionally think of family engagement, but it's still very important. Um, and also along with this principle is the shift from deficit to assets based. So that really means using our advocacy skills because when we hear someone making a comment that's deficit based, what can we say to respond to that? How can we shift so that we make sure that we're building on um, students and families assets and what we know about them as a tool? So some of the look for's for guiding principle one are that we pronounce students' names correctly, um, that teachers and uh, staff learn a few words or phrases in students' home language, or that we have these displayed um, around the school. Again, so valuing students' backgrounds, cultural and linguistic backgrounds. Uh, that we learn about students' interests outside of school. So we don't just think about what's happening academically, but we also think what are their strengths outside of school. And that we provide supports for overcoming obstacles. So this could be, for an example, if there's a student who traditionally or frequently arrives late, rather than penalizing that student, because maybe it's not his, you know, it, no fault of his or her own, um, having a place where the student comes in and he or she knows she can go to that, that place in the room to pick up any handouts that are needed, or there's a peer who's a de designated point person that student could turn to. So what are the strategies that we can use, again, to so provide support for overcoming obstacles? And there are a lot of different strategies for promoting um, ML's assets, and I'd love to hear your own strategies that you use. So one, one way is to encourage storytelling. We all like to hear a good story and having students share their stories if they're willing. Again, we want to give them choice through journaling, um, through assignments, can be a great way to form a relationship to learn more about their assets so that we can share those with others and that we can appreciate those. Um, secondly, to share uh, success stories, whether it's big or small, think about how you can share those stories in your schools and in your communities. Spending time in ML communities so you can learn more about students' communities and the assets they bring. So maybe shopping, attending events, these are all things to help you learn no more about your students in the background. And finally, uh, sharing quantitative data. Um, so Often we think about um, we think about how test scores are compared between English learners and non-English learners. But for example, are we looking at um, scores of former our former L's as a way? Um, because we have seen that Title III data is coming out and showing that former L's are actually um, a higher percentage of former L's are scoring proficient on math, reading, ELA. Um, then when we look at the percentages for all students. So again, trying to look at that data and see what does it show about students' assets. I just want to share an example of a success story. This is out of Jefferson County Public Schools in Kentucky. They are offering an interpreter training course in a bilingual high school to students, and this is a great way to leverage students' strengths and also serves as an important community need, fulfills a need in the community. And they've done a great job of publicizing this program in the newspaper and the local TV and radio. So I'd love to hear you share now. What are ways that you are sharing um, student success stories or what are ways that you were fostering an assets-based perspective of your multilingual learners and their families? Go ahead and share that in the chat. We're always looking for more ways to share assets-based perspectives.
I'll keep going, but please feel free to keep adding in the chat. So guiding principle two um, is that um, culturally responsive teaching simultaneously supports and challenges. And so the first is um, the first part of this is to provide access to content and programs. So think about to what extent are students getting access to these programs. The next is support for acquiring language and accessing content. Again, so thinking about the scaffolding that were provided, the instructional supports, so that students do have access to that challenging content. And then the third, and this is probably the um, least frequently discussed, is that idea of challenging, to think critically, um, to support students in thinking critically and building cross-curricular connections. So how are we pushing students? How are we challenging them? Going back to that idea of culturally responsive and teaching in the brain, how are we helping students' brain grow as they're challenged? Um, so some of the look for's for guiding principle two are making sure that we're providing grade level content and texts but that we're scaffolding it so that students have access to that. So are we using visuals? Are we using home language support? Um, what are some of the, the scaffolds? Are we using peer grouping? All as a way to provide access to that challenging and rigorous content. Uh, another look for is that the activities require students to consider alternative ways of understanding information. So we wanna make sure that we're including underrepresented ideas and viewpoints so that students um, have an opportunity to look at something from all different sides, from all different viewpoints. And along those guidelines, we're provide, along those lines, we're providing a space um, for students to share their perspectives. And then also in this uh, look for is the access to and support for gifted honors and college preparatory classes. So that can be a great place for you to look at equity in your schools, thinking about um, are your um, multilingual learners underrepresented in gifted program, in honors classes or college preparatory classes? And if so, why? What steps need to be taken to make sure that they have equal access to those programs? And I see that Anna's shared Students earn by literacy seals on their diploma and we recognize their achievement for all to see. And I think that that's great. And that fits right along with I, this idea too, right? How are we supporting them? And we're honoring, um, honoring that aspect of students. So thank you for sharing that. I also wanted to talk a little bit about being a warm and informed demander. Um, so Zaretta Hammond, talks about the work of Judith Kleinfeld, who worked with um, Inuit and Yupik students in Anchorage, Alaska. And she talked about the importance of having high expectation for all students with the goal of creating students who are independent learners, who have um, more autonomy for their learning and use a positive academic mindset. And we added to that this idea of informed demander to make sure that we really know our students. So again, that we're able to provide that support that students need in order to be successful, in order to, um, to meet those challenges. So I'd love to have um, hear from you in the chat. What do you think it looks like to be a warm and informed demander in your school? What does that, if we wanna say, oh, that teacher is being a warm and informed demander. What is he demander? What is he or her, she doing in the classroom? Anyone wanna share? your thoughts on what it means. I'll give just a minute. All right, feel free to keep adding. We'd love to hear your thoughts. Guiding principle three is that students are at the center of the learning. And this is really an instructional approach that integrates student voice and student choice. And it means that students are helping to shape the content, the instructional activities, the material, the assessments, the pace, um, all those things. And when we want to talk about the look force, um, it looks like pair, lots of pair and small group work. So again, giving students an opportunity to share their ideas and work together, using peer and group work as a scaffold, um, having students and teachers develop norms and expectations together, involving MLs in goal setting and assessment 
Um, and this is really something even the most experienced teachers that we work with are still working on trying to include students in, in self assessment and goal setting right so taking steps to do that. And then also providing students um, opportunities to speak and write about their lives. Sorry about that. Um, so here's an example of a self assessment word learning strategy. Um, and you can see that students, these are different ways of responding when students see a word um, that they don't know in a text. And you can have them think about it. What are the strategies that they're, that they're using? Um, and which ones are they not using? What ones might they need more practice with? So for example, when they see a word they don't know, do they say the word aloud? Do they think about whether the word is a cognate? Do they look for clues around the word that can help understand the meaning? Um, do they look about word parts or do they look up the word in a glossary or dictionary? Um, do they try to understand the sentence without knowing the meaning of a word? And again, this is shared on Padlet and it can be adapted for different types of strategies, again, to help students be, think about and reflect on their learning. Guiding principle four is leverages students' linguistic and cultural backgrounds. And again, this really builds on assets number one, the assets-based perspective. Um, because we want to build on students' backgrounds in order to help them feel understood and valued in order to allow for the sharing of diverse perspectives. Um, and also because it helps them learn, right, when they start with, with prior learning and experiences. And some of the look for's are strategies to assess, activate, and build background knowledge, school curricula that includes perspectives of individuals from students' home cultures, multicultural and bilingual resources, and including multilingual leaders and role models in the learning. Um, so those are all look for's. So what I want to do now is I want to share with you a video. As Diane mentioned, we were very fortunate. We got to um, film in Syracuse City School District. And I want to share with you this um, short video clip of a high school, um, a high school history class. And you can see, as you watch, think about what strategies did the teacher use to activate and build students' background knowledge? And what takeaways do you have from the video? I'm going to put a couple questions up on the board that I want you to discuss with the people in your group. Okay. We started today just sort of with an introductory question, just sort of getting them talking in their groups um, and also hopefully connecting to their own personal experiences of um, forced movement for one reason or another. We did that and then uh, we watched a quick video um, just again to sort of front load some of the content so they would have a little bit more exposure to it, followed by a short paragraph of, of notes, um, sort of filling in some of the key concepts and um, things that will often appear on a Regents exam. Have you ever moved? and why. So I want you, as you're writing the objective, take a couple minutes to just talk in your groups about these questions. Ladies, if you're in a same language group and you want to talk in your language, that's fine, okay? Take a couple minutes to discuss this. So from Puerto Rico, here, and then I went to Florida, and I went back here. Go somewhere, because okay. the country problems are how the economy is. Uh, when they move from the world, they don't choose it. They have to move to save their life. Yeah. Yeah. The reason people move, mm -hmm. I told them, because I guess and sometimes it's because they don't feel safe, okay. and then sometimes it's because they just want to move to take new experiences. Do any of you guys have family that have moved to the States in the last couple of years? Uh, yeah. Why? Because sometimes, like you said, it's not safe or they don't have enough space or just they want to start a new life. What else happened recently? Or they want to start a career. Okay. Well, one of the things that works particularly well with this group of students is that they've been together a lot. So they have a lot of relationships sort of already established. So there's a, a sense of comfort. Um, even to the point that at the beginning of the year, at one point, I had students that were like, Miss, why aren't all of my classes like this? Like, I feel safe. I feel like I can talk and express myself. 
Um, but again, I think that's a lot of why I sort of try and front load some of the content, whether through the video or through the notes um, or through conversation about their own experience, so that then when they're diving into um, a document, they have a little bit of context for what it's about. Um, I also had tablets at each of the stations where they could use Google Translate for those that have first language literacy. Um, so some of them are real quick to sort of seek that out on their own. Others sort of need to be prodded to do it a little bit more. Um, like my my Arabic girls um, that sort of travel in a group, um, they're very good about seeking that out for themselves and they will often have their phones out to translate and things like that. Um, I also added uh, some additional images to each of the pages too. So they didn't all come with a map, but I figured adding the context of a map, um, like in one of the documents it made a lot of references to different states. Um, and I knew that most of them weren't going to have an idea of exactly where Louisiana and Tennessee and all of these places were. And so um, I put maps alongside of it just to sort of add some additional context for them as well. All right, guys, let's come back together for a second. Okay. I heard a lot of good things. A couple of reasons that people move. Someone shout out a few. Okay, maybe war. What else? Jobs. Jobs. Safety. Okay. All right. Um, do people always pick where they move or choose where they move to? No. Sometimes yes, sometimes no. Okay. And did you guys get a chance to talk about have you moved? Yeah. Okay. You had those conversations in your groups. We don't need to get into all of that today, okay? But we all have various reasons for why we've moved, all right? Today we're going to talk about a reason why some people in American history moved, okay? And we're going to sort of see answers to a few of these questions in that situation. All right. So going back to these questions, I'd love to hear um, to have you share in the chat, what strategies did the teacher use to activate and build students' background? And what takeaways did you have from the video? What did you think? You can go ahead and share in the chat. Group work, the use of group work. Yeah, you could see the way the room was set up um so that they they did a lot of group work i think and they and they were clearly used to working together starting with the kids asking them about their own moving experiences great so she yeah the teacher acknowledges the various cultures in the room using that oral language pete first so starting with an oral language activity using um having students use home language yeah great Thank you very much. Um, so the, fi the final guiding principle is uniting students, schools, families, and communities. And this is really the piece, the connections with families and students' communities. Um, so this is thinking about the welcoming environment that is created for ML families. How do they feel when they first enter the school? Um, and what do you do to welcome them? Building relationships with ML families thinking about how we communicate effectively with families using a variety of different ways, overcoming barriers to ML family engagement, and then finally empowering them. Think of, thinking about how we help ML families advocate for themselves. Um, and some of the look fors, some of the look fors um, are to visually demonstrate a commitment to ML family. So as I mentioned, when families first come through the door, do they see signs in their home language? Do they see images that represent them and their families? Do they see flags from their home cultures? Um, do they see their students' work displayed around? Providing interpreters for all school events so that, um, that language is not a barrier to family engagement using a variety of tools to communicate with ML families. And we've seen a lot of that in this, this past year. And, and also surveying families so we know what communication tools they prefer. Make sure that we're using the tools and means of communication that they feel most comfortable with. And then finally, removing barriers that might prevent ML families from participating. So is it, uh, are we surveying families to make sure we're providing events at times 
that they're free? Are we providing interpreters? Are we providing childcare if needed? Um, are, are we making sure that our, our space feels welcoming and that they feel comfortable there, that there's not a level of fear coming to the school? So all those things are things that we can do um, to, to foster family engagement. And on the Padlet, you'll see we shared a tool with some possible barriers as well as possible solutions for each. And you can see here language um, barrier, having parent liaison, bilingual staff, translated materials, transportation as a barrier, providing rides to school events or ride sharing resources, information about public transportation, um, time, again, as I mentioned, being flexible in scheduling conferences and school events. So right now, um, we're going to launch a poll, and I, we'd love to hear from you. Which of the guiding principles are you most interested in acting on in your context? Um, is it one, CRT is assets-based? Two, it, CRT simultaneously supports and challenges, places students at the center of the learning, leverages students' linguistic and cultural backgrounds, and unites students, schools, families, and communities. And I can see we're having a lot of responses. Great, thank you so much. Take just another minute or so to have you share. All right. I think we can go ahead and end the poll and share that so we can all see. Um, so here you can see the poll results said that, that it was really mixed, um, but the 28% of you chose uniting students, schools, families, and communities. And I think after this year, we realized how important that is. Um, and we've already started some of that. I think that's been one of the areas where we there have been stronger partnerships between schools and homes. So as we think about next year, how can we build on what we've already began? Great. Thank you very much. All right. Okay, so we're going to go ahead um, and wrap up and talk a little bit about applying these. I want to share another tool with you. Um, that, that you can think about and you could also share with colleagues. And this is called My Multifaceted Identity. Um, and in this, you can see it's an opportunity for you to think about aspects of your identity that impact who you are as an educator, that you bring to your interactions with multilingual learners and their families. And you can see I chose mother of daughters, ML advocate, being white, a traveler, an educator, um, and I've reflected on why those things are, why those aspects of my identity matter. Um, so for example, recognizing the educational and professional opportunities that I was offered um, because I was white based on my race and recognizing the personal work that I need to do in order to be an ally. Um, so I want to, rather than, I know when we want, we want to make sure we have time for questions. Um, so I'm not going to do this, but I encourage you to go ahead and check out the Padlet and think about your own multifaceted identity. Um, if you want to, if you want to share, what is an aspect of your um, identity that you think impacts who you are as an educator? I wanted to share two additional tools that are on the Padlet. One is a cultural awareness, knowledge, and skills set self-assessment. So it helps you to think about different um, aspects of cultural knowledge and understanding and where, where your strengths are and areas where you might want to work. Um, and then there's also a unit planning template. Again, another tool that you can share with colleagues to plan culturally responsive units um, and lessons. So I'd love to hear now in the chat if anyone wants to share your greatest takeaway from today please feel free to add that. And then I think we're gonna um, move on to the questions. So again, the objectives for today were to explore the definition of culture and its characteristics, to learn about the role of culture in teaching and learning, uh, discuss five guiding principles for developing a culturally responsive school climate uh, for multilingual learners and explore tools related to that. And finally, give you a chance to apply that to your own context. I know we've gone through this content very quickly, um, so I appreciate that. Um, 
But now we're, we're happy to open it up for questions, if anyone wants to share. So I have a couple of questions for you. Uh, question one, would you encourage educators to use the term multilingual learners versus English learners? That's, yeah, Sydney, is it okay if I kind of jump in here? <laughs> yeah, we, uh, we explain in our first chapter of, you know, kind of why we chose the term multilingual learners. It's, and how that, what the commonalities and differences are between English learners and multilingual learners. Um, we're noticing that it seems like our field is shifting to the term they're using. For example, the WIDA consortium now is using multilingual learners. Um, for example, another colleague from Corwin, Ivani Soto, her uh, ELL shadowing became multilingual learner shadowing in her second edition of the book. And multilingual learners is more inclusive in terms of which students that we're talking about. So they don't necessarily qualify for any kind of ESL or ESOL or ELD services, um, but they could be speaking a heritage language or be exposed to a heritage language, but maybe not be found eligible for services or also maybe be found eligible for language support services. So, um, you know, just, it, I guess, Janet, and hi, Janet, from Iowa. Um, you know, it really would depend on what your purpose is in the using the term and selecting the term. So I hope that helps. Terrific, thank you very much. I have the next question. You know, the difference between the states are very large. Like, for example, here in Mississippi, there are no resources and no openness to multilingual views. It is perhaps different in other states. How can I initiate this type of change in a school system like I just described? Yeah, so going back to this idea of there's so many different aspects um, of culturally, res culturally responsive teaching. And so maybe you really wanna focus on the assets piece first. So thinking about how we, um, how, how multilingual learners are viewed in your schools and how they're talked about and how their families are talked about um, and then trying to help shift that. So again, I think it's really important to work with allies, with people who you know, who um, kind of are on the same page as you and, and really prioritize. What do you think is most important and most critical of this work and how can, what are the first steps that you can take? Um, yeah. And maybe it's starting with getting some professional development. Um, so reaching out to your administrator. Diane, do you want to jump in? Yeah, I was going to also add on to those great ideas that in terms of prioritizing, look at choosing something that you think you would have the ability to change, that you know, you know, there might be a chance where you could make a change instead of focusing in an area where uh, chances are pl pretty slim that you'll be able to make inroads. Um, and I, I think we quote in our book, you know, the expression, how, how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time, right? So focusing on something small where you do have a chance of having some success. And like Sydney said, said finding those, those colleagues and fellow um, allies to support you. And that's a great question. Thanks, I think we have time for one more. Are there any tips on helping ML students be successful in middle school science? And that might apply to science in general. Yeah, science is a really language rich subject, right? Like with, there's so many opportunities for the hands-on aspect. Um, and so I would really encourage, especially in science to look at, you know, what kind of aspects of culturally responsive teaching could you embed? You know, the peer-to-peer -peer learning, for example, is really critical. Um, placing students at the center of learning, finding out what their interests are, um, learning about scientists from the students' home cultures, for example, if you're studying biology, are there biologists that are well-known in, in their cultures, for example, bringing in multilingual resources, um, those kinds of uh, strategies could help you get started. And also asking the students, you know, what interests them about science? What, what makes it interesting? 
Yeah, I also think really focusing on the academic language of science. So helping them learn that vocabulary and giving them, as Diane said, opportunities to practice it in pairs or groups. So try out what it feels like to use that language to describe experiments, to describe, you know, their observations, what they're seeing. I think those, um, I do think science is a really exciting way to teach and practice language. Absolutely. Terrific. Um, I think now would be a good time to turn it over to uh, Sharon Pendergast from uh, Corwin with some additional information for everyone. I just want to- Thank you. Go ahead, Sharon. Go ahead. I was just going to say that if you're interested in learning more, um, we have a book study that is um, framed around the book. So it's fully online and self-paced. And if you're interested in reading the book and you also need some professional development hours, it's worth 20 hours um, of PD credit. Um, so we have, Diane has shared it with you in, um, in the chat. Thank you. Thank you for um, mentioning that as well. Um, it did occur to me when the, um, educator from Mississippi was asking about where do you start um, that that might be a nice PLC um, thing or you could share this video um, with it with um, with your colleagues as well um, so thank you thank you to everyone who came and thank you Diane and Sydney for that practical engaging and information packed session if you'd like to learn more um, about culturally responsive teaching for multilingual learners, Tools for Equity, or any of um, Diane and Sydney's other books, you can use promo code HERO in all caps at www.corwin.com um, for 30% off plus free shipping, which we're running the full month um, because we didn't think, especially this year, that um, a week of teacher appreciation was going to cut it. Um, so through the end of May, please use um, promo code uh, HERO in all caps to save 30% plus free shipping. So this concludes our presentation. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a good evening. <laughs>